Welcome to the Cincy Postcast. I'm your host, Kevin Wallace, and before we dive into today's episode, I want to tell you about our friends at The Empanadas Box. The Empanadas Box is a small, family-owned restaurant owned by natives of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and they have Argentine-style empanadas with 22 other globally-inspired flavors available every single day. Looking for a suggestion? Well, how about the Oktoberfest empanada with bratwurst from LK Sausage? It also has cabbage, carrots, onion, and mustard that is only available in the month of September. Their empanadas are available for dine-in and carry-out, but the pro move here is to get a box of frozen ones to take home. You can also find them in your favorite food delivery app. You can check them out online at theempanadasbox.com or check the link down in the description. You can find more information there, including information on their catering options for lunches, parties, and more. And a special offer to listeners of the Postcast, well, they're offering 10% off your order at their Covington, Kentucky location if you mention the Postcast at checkout. They're at 212 West Pike Street in Covington, and I am happy to report that the staff there are incredibly nice and the Food is top notch. If you've been listening to the postcast, you know we've been talking these guys up well before they were a sponsor of the postcast. So, again, special thanks to the Empanadas Box, incredible folks there. And if you go to their Covington, Kentucky location, they'll get you 10% off for mentioning the postcast. And on today's episode of the postcast, the international break continues for FC Cincinnati. No news, just more waiting. As we await the resumption of play in MLS, we take a look to see how players from the Orange and Blue fared in their international duties. Aaron Bapenza and Gabon take that L in the African Cup of Nations qualifiers. Santiago Arias and Junior Moreno sadly relegated to the bench for their international stint. What's the point of calling an international player up anyway if you're just going to sit them? We also look at news around MLS. We table watch a little bit. The results this weekend, not bad if you're an FC Cincinnati fan. We dive into the saga surrounding Bruce Arena. Why on earth was this process so opaque? What the hell took so long to reach this result? We finish up with a little in the 11 out of the 18, and that, ladies and gentlemen, will be your postcast. JTM, hit it. Oh, and joining me to talk about all that is Grayson. No Kevin, just Grayson, just me. Grayson, how does this first weekend of the NFL season find you? Not great. No. Not great. No, I suspect you that's know? the I suspect that's everybody here in the listening area for the most part. Um, and I it's just one of those things where looking back on it, it's either gonna be uh, a sign of what was to come. Or it's going to be, well, nobody had a preseason together and they just kind of figured it out early in the season when they went along. Yeah. Yeah. It, I was with a bunch of my, uh, my Bengals fan friends watching this at our local watering hole. And the one thing I kept saying, calming them down, which is a really weird position to be in when you're cheering for a team that's starting Baker Mayfield at quarterback. But um, what I did note, and I do believe this is true, is that. Joe Burrow looked like a player who hadn't thrown an NFL pass since um, what would have been January. Yeah, yeah. He, I, looked, he looked like a guy that hadn't thrown a football since January in a competitive lineup. So I was curious about this. When they took him out, he had a fifty-two point two quarterback rating, according to a journalist I saw on Twitter. If that number's right, it is exactly 0.1 below Patrick Mahomes' worst ever quarterback rating. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, um, but That's not good. <laughs> yeah. It's a... Uh, I... No, nothing, nothing looked good. No, nothing looked good. Um, it also sucks that Deshaun Watson gets to 
As far as I'm concerned, I believe this fully exonerates Deshaun Watson. It heals Deshaun Watson. We can embrace him again as an NFL community for winning a big game like this. It was redemptive that he won the Brown Super Bowl. He did. Yes, this is <laughs> the, the Brown Super Bowl. Brown Super Bowl winner Deshaun Watson, um, honorary member of Cincy Jacks, I believe. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely honorary. He might uh, probably member of Cleveland. Cleveland Steamers, <laughs> Cleveland Jacks, the Beachwood Jacks, yeah. the Akron Jacks. Like I think he had memberships to all of the local clubs in the greater Cleveland area. Um, <laughs> The uh, West, the West Lake shakes. I don't know. I don't know if that works. The multiple shakes. If you shake it more than th- shake it more than three times, everybody knows what you're doing. That's that's conventional. I believe. Wisdom. I believe in Mormonism. You're allowed two shakes. Two shakes and a soak. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, my one hot take coming out of it is it was frustrating, and there's like a lot of reasons for it, which is why this is a hot take. You know, but right. my one hot take coming out of it was, um, he was throw like it felt like the entire game plan was not for him to make a make a throw or find an open guy or like really move the ball downfield. No, he was doing a lot of like short passes, behind the line passes. Um, a couple of long passes that were like forced and it's like, well, this is not a good pass by any means. Right. But maybe your receivers can do this. But like if the if the play is if so so often like throw to Jamar Chase behind the line of scrimmage and Jamar Chase is gonna make something happen, or on like third and eight, third and ten, we're gonna throw a five yard pass to one of the receivers and hope he beats a couple of guys. That's not gonna cut it for a Two hundred and seventy-five million dollar quarterback. No, like I'm not begrudging the money, but if you take that money, you take that you take on the responsibility where you're the playmaker. You need to drive the offense. Yes, this is what I'm looking for. There is nothing that makes me happier in Cincinnati sports than when we turn on players when they get paid. I'm not turning on him. I'm <laughs> yes. not turning on him. I'm just Let saying. Hate. Let the hate flow through you. I'm we just love saying... them when we love them when they're not making money. As soon as they make money, we turn on them. No, I still, I think, I think he can do it. I have, I have all the faith in Joe. You know, my, my overall opinion of him hasn't, hasn't changed, but you know, just he's with the team through 2029. He's going to be eating up a ton of cap space. Right. He's just got to be worth that amount of cap space. Now you're not just like a DP has got to be a D got to give you DP production. You're, you're not a UC fan, but like today's offense with the Bengals reminded me a lot of the Butch Jones era of UC football where everything that was happening was within a 14-yard bubble of seven yards behind the line of scrimmage and seven yards in front of the line of scrimmage. And there was no attempt at verticality. There was no attempts to get guys open downfield. And the offense basically consisted of, I'm going to throw the football to someone short and rely on their superior athletic ability to make somebody miss and create yardage. And that's just... I watched that fail at UC for a number of years. That was the Tampa Bay offense last year was we have Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, and Tom Brady go out there and athletic your way to a completion and a drive. And it's like you just can't do that in the modern NFL. You've got to scheme guys open. You've got to design plays that get guys open. You've got to push the ball downfield. But it's the first game. It's really preseason game number one for Joe Burrow and the Bengals offense. As a neutral fan who was watching this at the same time as Baker Mayfield preheating the oven and baking up a win, um, I think the Bengals are going to be fine. I think I, I think everyone needs to, in the immortal words of Aaron Rodgers, relax. Yeah, and it's not like Deshaun Watson was good. No, God no, he was skipping past. So I just people. want to I want that to be clear. No, defense. Deshaun Watson wasn't good. Just the Bengals were bad, atrocious. Yeah, that de- the de- Bengals defense was fine. Like under normal circumstances, if they're scoring points and putting the Browns behind, there's no way the Browns win that game. If the Bengals put any kind of offensive display on, they were allowed to do anything they wanted, take their time, find their plays, and they eventually found more plays than the Bengals. But you don't listen to this but, podcast for yeah. NFL football. 
No, sir. No, ma'am. You listen to us for soccer and all things FC Cincinnati and FC Cincinnati adjacent. And here we find ourselves, Grayson. Um, you missed last week the uh, midweek show. We, yeah, I got stuck at Burning Man. Yeah. How was, got, uh, how was that? You bring got, an umbrella for I got, the I got, I got dengue fever, and I was riding a buggy out and had to pick up uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Diplo and Chris Rock. <laughs> there was a great rumor going around online that Ebola, there was an Ebola outbreak at Burning Man. That was funny that that, that, that took off, because... There wasn't Ebola at Burning Man. No. Come on, people. There, there wasn't. It was so obviously, like, a, a bit. Like, it was so obviously a joke. But here's the thing, is that all I know about Burning Man is that it's someplace I've never been. A lot of people show up for it. I was, like, low-key shocked a few years ago to learn that Burning Man didn't have um, a musical festival component to it. I thought for certain Burning Man had like, you know, DJs playing or artists that I've never heard of. And to find out that there is no like three stage setup at Burning Man, kind of like Coachella or, you know, shit like that or um, Bonnaroo, that was a shock to me. So, um, yeah, like I don't know a lot about what goes on at at Burning Man. I, I think it's a lot of drugs and a lot of people doing drugs and engaging in, you know, you know, non-school safe activities with one another. So given all that, when somebody says Ebola is going on at Burning Man, it sounds fishy, but it also is like, well, I'm going to do a little more investigating to find out how fishy this really is. Because would it shock me that Ebola was happening at Bonnaroo? N- not really, given everything I know about what people do at Bonnaroo. I don't know. So um, I, I guess I didn't realize how many like celebrities and I guess luminaries attend Burning Man. It's an interesting phrasing, um, luminary. Well, I, I tried to think of a catch-all term for just like non-famous people who are in prominent positions. Like apparently Grover Norquist has been going to uh to do uh, Burning what? Man for like for like 20 years. What do they not have a is it a sales tax haven? Well, they don't you know they don't uh, I believe they only barter Oh. Nothing is bought or sold at Burning Man. Oh, so it's, so it's like a libertarian's he dream. Probably likes that he never gets to pay taxes right. <laughs> there. Um, Neil Kotyal was at Burning Man, uh, the Supreme Court litigator yeah. extraordinaire. You know, he has all that child slave defending money. Right. So he got to, so he gets to go to Burning Man for a week, um, and he had the most embarrassing, most embarrassing picture. Oh, no. Like I want to go to like the. The kids that are the, the child slaves that are uh, ma- getting the cocoa for for Nestle, <laughs> and take his picture around to them and just be like, "This man is responsible," and they're gonna they would there would be an uprising, right? There would be a war. Like you're drug doing drug. this so this guy can do this, yeah. the, so this guy can wear a propeller beanie, right? The, to the ne- to the desert. The next thing that would be burning is the fields. <laughs> Can you think um, of anyone less fun to drop acid with and and be in the middle of nowhere with than with than Grover Norquist? Everybody there, you know. It, apparently, Eric Schmidt did his job interview with Google at Burning Man. I what? I've learned so much about Burning Man in this last week, <laughs> and like I have, I I known, I've known a couple of people over the years who have gone to Burning Man or frequently go to Burning Man who are, I guess, like, stereotypically, like, you know, like, woo-woo kind of, woo-woo kind of in-their-feelings people who like to do psychedelics at right. Electric Forest and shit. And um, and then I went to the, I've been to the Burner Compound. I don't even know if it's still there, on the West End, the Koi Pound. Um, and it seemed like also like just, like, kind of just crunchy people. Right. You know? Um, it was a good time. Yeah. You know, cheap, cheap drinks. There was a fire, fire dancer or whatever. Um, but now that there's like Chris Rock and Diplo and, uh, politicians and all these tech executives and stuff, it, it wasn't appetizing to me to start. Right. And now there's like nowhere I want to be less. And frankly, if we're going to put a bola somewhere, 
this seems like a good place to right <laughs> good, good play good target you know it does it does give off the vibes of if someone you know turned both keys and launched the nuclear missile and it happened to come down at burning man i think it feels like a lot of people that no one would miss have you ever been to um like slab city no or like east jesus or like the salton sea in california I've been to the Salton Sea. I've not been to the other places. So there are these places where people essentially like are squatting like in in improvised kind of structures right. and stuff. And yeah, com- you could go, there's like it's like a commune living, right? Like that sort of shit. Not really. Yeah. It's not really a commune. It's more like they all like live in the same place. And there is like I think kind of like a negotiation regarding like how much is like shared between certain people and who like to stay away from. Cause some of the people I think it's kind of are like kind of the, on the run from the law. Yeah, kind of and the, some of them are like young hippie druggy people. Other than the running from the law thing, this sounds a lot like when I had to move in with my parents after I got out of grad school. But so like, it's like a neat little place to drive through. You don't, you, you kind of tell it, you, you can kind of tell you're not welcome. Yeah. Uh, when you're, when you're there, um, but it'd be like if I found out that like Stephen Miller was living <laughs> in one of these places, <laughs> or like, uh, or, or like uh, David Axelrod, right? Was was like, <laughs> well, like you you went by and Clarence Thomas and his RV were like right there just chilling and hanging out. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I have so many questions now about what the fuck this actually is. <laughs> yeah, um. You know, a cleansing rain sometimes is good for a lot of people when it comes to this sort of stuff. Uh, I don't know. Not good for throwing the football, though. No, not great for throwing the football. Maybe maybe Deshaun Watson would find Commune and find his people at Burning Man. Maybe that's where he needs to go to clear himself of some of his proclivities. He should definitely go to Burning Man next year. He seems like a Burning Man type of a person. Uh, I think he'd love it the most. <laughs> Maybe that's where all the FC players are this week that aren't on international duty. Um, Yeah, there's not a lot. I'm going to spoil this episode right at the top for everyone listening. There's not a lot going on in the FC verse right now, but, but we are now beholden to sponsors. So God damn it. You're going to get content. Kevin may be off gallivanting around the deep South in DeSantisville, but you got the two of us to talk what little FCC news there is. And what little FCC news there is starts with our international duty roundup. Yes, we've got players on international duty. Let's talk first about, speaking of players that need to live up to their contract status, much like Joe Scheisty, Aaron Bapenza, out on international duty with Gabon. Um, Gabon did, in fact, lose. So they are out of the African Cup of Nations, I believe, with this result. Yep. They, did, they failed to qualify. This uh, this game was, by all accounts, and I didn't watch, full disclosure, uh, looked bananas. I believe a goalkeeper, their goalkeeper for Gabon was sent off with a red card within the first couple minutes of the match. In like the fifth minute. Which, I, um, you know, I kind of yeah. like that. You know, shit. Maybe if you're a goalkeeper, maybe not in a game that's like a knockout game that you have to win. But would you really be mad if, you know, one of the first couple games of the season, if Celentano on the corner kick, just up and decked a striker. You know, it's kind of like illegally hitting the quarterback in football. Do you want to do it? No, it's a penalty. It's bad for your team. But if you do it on, like, the first series and really just tattoo the fucker after the play, it's in his head for the rest of the game that you're possibly not going to follow the rules. And it's hard to unknow that sort of thing. I was listening to – I watched – I caught, like, the end of the Indianapolis Colts game today because it's what they put on right after the uh, Bengals game. Right. And the announcer, I don't know who it was, said something bonkers. So uh, Richardson get, got like knocked out of the game late with like a, a basically like a helmet to helmet hit. Welcome to the NFL hit. We don't talk. We don't call targeting yeah. at this level. And um, the announcer said, "He's like, oh, when you're a, when you're a defender, and you see a quarterback running, you get excited because like you think." All right, if I can knock him out of this game and we get the second string up, maybe we can win. And I'm like, I don't know you should be saying that. <laughs> like, I don't know you should be saying that you're actually thinking about knocking the quarterback out of the game when you 
when you hit him. That was like when the uh, who was the Greg Williams for the Saints when he got suspended from the NFL, and uh, Sean Payton got suspended for running a bounty gate where they were putting money up for grabs to pay players that knocked opposing starters out of the game. It's like, yeah, we all know that goes on. You just can't get caught doing that. You can't say that. That's the part you can't say out loud. Like, you're not allowed to say shit like that. That's not. Although, strangely, that was not the most out-of-pocket thing said during an NFL telecast today. Oh, my God. Did you see the Matt Ryan? Wait, no. Oh, no, that no, was, no, that no, was no. a college Sorry. thing yesterday. That yeah, was yeah, college. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. No, during the during an NFL telecast, apparently Matt Ryan has joined the broadcast booth. He was calling the Bucks uh, vikings game today, and somebody said, boy, with the way this game is played, it feels like it should be 28-3 to three right now. And I'm like, boy, that is a... That is a mean thing to say to Matt Ryan specifically. <laughs> yeah. No, the Adipo- the college thing yesterday about he was a foster kid and nobody wanted him was absolutely it was like, it was like last year Last year in the transfer portal, everybody, it seemed like everybody wanted him. But 11 years ago when, it fo- when he was a foster kid, nobody wanted him. <laughs> <laughs> like, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Like, what a... F- what a screwed up thing to say about somebody <laughs> like if, if you leave that type of stuff to like the little feature you do on him late in the season where right. you like you interview about being a foster kid. Right. Don't like say like <laughs> foster kids <laughs> are just are unwanted. discarded, <laughs> unloved, unwanted <laughs> because it's not necessarily true. No. And like, do you, and even, Do you know that about that guy? Or you also, just know that he was a foster kid? Even if it is true, you don't say that. Well, of course you don't say it. <laughs> I don't care. Like, truth is not a defense in this whole situation. Yeah, but I'm, I'm trying to say it's also just bad it's, journalism. Yeah, it's, it's, it's terrible. <laughs> it's not just poor taste. <laughs> it's unsourced bad journalism. Right. Were you there? Did you see that other people were being adopted and he wasn't? Come on. You got to you got to you got to attribute that. Yes. You got to talk to like right. three potential parents and be like, "Oh, I didn't want this guy." Unnamed sources are indicating <laughs> that nobody wanted this no, it's, kid. It's not it's not funny. I mean, it's kind of You know, funny. what the, whatever the guy went through, but it's but it's funny now. It's funny that, that an announcer did that. Right. Yeah, we're, to be clear, we're not lost laughing at the plight of foster children. We're definitely laughing at the the in- insanity of a announcer deciding that a, a telecast is the right way to just drop this nugget of information in from his research. So anyway, Bapenza, um, did you watch this game at all? I didn't. It doesn't look- I did. I found a I found a stream on YouTube. Good for you. How did Aaron look? Yeah. Uh he was invisible. They didn't get the ball to him hardly ever. Um when they did, he was, you know, there were like three guys around him. Right. He won a couple of corners. Um did he appear he- but- did he appear healthy at the end of the game? He looked fine, and like uh, you know, in his defense, like Aubameyang didn't do shit either. No, like it was, it was a bad, it was it was a bad game from Gabon's standpoint, and um, their their you know deep defense and midfield were horrible. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and you, you know, giving up a red card at the in the fifth minute. That's tough. Yeah, I was about to say, you don't really expect a lot from the attacking pieces from a team when you're playing down a man for the better part of 80 minutes. And I do want to point out that when Gabon's coach had the opportunity to sub out a field player to replace the goalie, he chose to sub out Denis Buanga and not Aaron Bupenza. More integral than Buanga. Interesting. You love to yeah, see So again, I, I think... You know, he's he's at least considered and, and their relative playing time for Gabon supports this. That if we can get Bupenza going, we could be looking at like a really a real big difference maker in the league. Yeah. And I just my hope is that we just haven't seen what he can bring yet. Right. My hope now at this point is that he successfully navigates the international waters back to the United States, which is never a given given the situation like we talked about last year. I'll be honest with you. This this has been bugging me for like weeks. Like once we saw that he was a, uh, um, once we saw that he was called up, I. Because remember, Arias had to Arias missed League's Cup, 
um, because he had to go back to Colombia because his visa that he was on didn't allow him to leave the country. Right. And they were anticipating that he would get called up to Colombia. Until Aaron Bupenza successfully leaves the country and comes back, I'm going to assume <laughs> that he's that he's going to have the same problem that Arias had. And uh, that was Mascara's problem too, right? Mascara's yeah. he got caught in visa Canada. situation was he wasn't allowed, he wasn't supposed to leave the country and he and he and he did. Right. As best we could tell, or as best that the limited amount of research, because I am not an immigration expert. I don't pretend to be an immigration expert. Please don't call me for immigration expert advice. But, as best but don't call whoever MLS uses either. Definitely don't do that either. Um, <laughs> do not. Find someone that knows what they're doing. As best I could tell, the Arias and Moreno visa situation was that they were on the... Mascara. Moreno has right. a green card. Mascara, yeah. Yeah, Moreno is gold. He's got a green I'm, card. I'm looking, he's good. I'm looking, he's good to go. Yeah, I'm looking at the rundown here. Mascara and Arias's visa issue was that they were on the type of visa that basically allows you to come in to look for work and try out for work. And the funny thing about uh, I don't know if we talked about this on the air, but the funny thing about the Arias visa situation specifically is that if you go and you time it out, um, we kept wondering why they hadn't announced that Arias was signing. And if you time it out, if this visa is good for six months after you find work, by waiting to announce that he had found uh, signed with FC Cincinnati until the very last possible minute in training, in the preseason training, it got him to the window where they could actually send him out of the country to go apply for the actual visa, the the what is it the one B visa or the P one the B one visa P P one P one the P one visa but like by waiting to sign him they actually bought enough time theoretically to get him to that legally which legally with a lowercase L and some qu- quotation marks around it because as best I can tell what they were doing was possibly legal I don't know like I said I'm not an expert I, in this line of uh, this I, have, I have no idea. Right. Like, we, we don't know. We don't know. But it it's not it's simply not true that, like, every player that leaves for inter- international duty gets blocked from coming back in the country because their visa doesn't let them come back in. No, that's absolutely not true. Right. Yeah. And so, like, again, you know, maybe maybe Bupenza, uh comes back because Gabon is done playing. So... You know, unless he's got a couple days vacation, you know, he should be back any day now, assuming no visa issues. And if he gets back in the country with no visa issues, I'll be happy. If he misses the next game, I'll be a little annoyed. Yeah. (laughs) Which basically means that right now, are you ready to declare that uh, that Bapenza watch is on, that we are now officially watching to see when Bapenza returns to training? So I think we'll probably record Wednesday. I'm guessing that's the schedule this week. Again, there is nothing going on, so it's it's entirely how. Yeah. Um. Let's let's revisit this on Wednesday. Yeah. I've, if we don't have any news about him being in training or being back in the country by Wednesday, I think we can declare Bupenza watch on. Right now, we have just what what's what's sub right? What's below a watch? Uh, we have a Bupenza like so. It hasn't reached tropical storm level. This is just tropical depression level right now in terms of panic. Just keep an eye on. I mean, it. if we lose to if we lose to Philly, I may hit a tropical depression. <laughs> how much alcohol is in a tropical depression, and how do you make it? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, we need to find that. Should out. crowdsource that. It's um, yeah, we're not we're not we're not hitting the panic button yet, but you know we're certainly looking around the room to see which buttons lighten up. I we're monitoring. monitoring. We're monitoring. We're monitoring the situation. We're monitoring the situation. Right. Oh, there is a cocktail called Tropical Depression. That sounds delicious. I don't know. It just it um, seems like it should. It looks l- good. A lot of rum. A little, right. little so, blue curacao, too, I'm guessing. No. Yeah. Maybe there's multiple versions, but here's what I found is the first result. Two ounce mango puree, two ounce strawberry puree, one ounce dark rum, one ounce triple sec, one ounce amaretto, and one ounce coconut cream. And then you you blend them. Sounds incredible. With ice, and then you and they garnished it with toasted coconut pineapple, pineapple, 
and maraschino cherries. You had to order the shit out of that. I would I would drink this. I would like to make it a little stronger, maybe two ounces of rum. Yeah. Maybe two ounces of or rum. Or maybe maybe an ounce of dark and an ounce of light. Yeah, an ounce of dark and an ounce of coconut. Ooh, Malibu. Yeah. Replace replace the coconut cream with uh Malibu. Yeah, I'm into it. I'm into it. That's good. That works for me. Um yeah, so let's see. Because the, here's the problem, too, is that uh, if he's not back in training by Wednesday, the usual path that we have seen with Pat Noonan is that if you aren't training and you're missing time for whatever reason internationally, you are unlikely to start. And that, that pretty much writes off Papenza as a starter if he isn't back with the team training by Wednesday. And that would be not good Uh for the team that needs to get the needs to get points or get some sort of a result from Philly this weekend, in my estimation, we also had Santiago Arias, the aforementioned Santiago Arias, and Junior Moreno out on international duty. But in what I consider to be the most infuriating uh, aspect of international duty, the player that gets called into international duty and then doesn't get used, where what are we doing here? I mean, good on them; they made their national team. I'm sure the friends they made along the way are the real real winners here, but it's frustrating when you lose guys and you lose training time with guys and time at the training facility, time getting their 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 time on the grease board, time working with the coaching staff. That's all lost so that they can go sit the bench for a game that, you know, otherwise doesn't really mean a whole lot for both the teams that were playing here. Am I wrong yeah, to be so frustrated by that? You're not you're not wrong to be frustrated. To be clear, they still have a chance to get some playing time. Both uh, Colombia and Venezuela have games on uh, Tuesday. Colombia plays Chile, and Venezuela plays Paraguay. So there's a chance they'll get used. But generally, I agree with the sentiment, especially since they call in, by the looks of it, so many people. Right. Um, but, like, we've we had guys miss time earlier this summer, both Morena and Mosquera, Moreno and Mosquera missed time because of their international duty this summer, and neither of them played on international duty. Right. But so Moreno got hurt and missed, I think, three games, and then Mosquera had his visa situation and missed, I think, two or two or three games. And I would hope that there would be some communication between the teams and the federations. And I know it's like, it's out of the team's hands really, but like this guy's got a visa situation. He can't, he can't get back and he's going to miss multiple games. If you call him in, right. Are you going to use him? Just let us know. Like just be up. Let front. us know. Yeah. Um, cause and I know that national teams do some, you know, make some accommodation because we had Swiderski last year uh, skip his national team duty to, duty for Poland because he was supposedly hurt. Well, that's and then he scored two goals against this. I mean, that's just uh, an outright fa- that's fabricating information to the national team. Well, to, to... Okay, but but what about this then? Uh, Drake Callender from Miami was called into the U.S. men's national team. And yet he played for Miami last night at the same time the U.S. was playing Uzbekistan in St. Louis. And they said on the broadcast that they had agreed to let him play that game for Miami. And then he would join the team, join the national team the next day. Huh. Interesting. And it just, it just feels like, it feels like some teams have regular seasons that are treated like, you know, they include games that matter. And some teams are not treated that way. Are you suggesting perhaps, perhaps that Miami received some sort of special privilege that wouldn't be afforded to other teams in a similar situation? I'm not. I'm not suggesting anything. Okay. <laughs> I'm. I'm saying it. <laughs> but, and like I support our players going to play for their national teams. I think it's cool that we had guys playing in African Cup of Nations qualifiers and I think 
South America World Cup qualifiers. Yeah. Uh, for you know, pretty good teams. And if FC Cincinnati stays competitive the way that we expect them to and want them to, you know, that's going to continue. I just want. I just want the rules to be same for everybody, you know? I feel like that's And if some teams can say like... That's the tagline for this podcast at this point. I just want the rules to be the same for everyone. If some teams can say like, if you're not going to use him, can we keep him? Why can't we we say that? Right. It's funny how I'm so much less bothered by all of this because the team is elected. And make no mistake, the teams can elect to do this that FC Cincinnati elected at the start of the season not to participate during international windows. Teams choose, yeah, that's fine. Teams choose to have games during the international break. In past years, we have made the choice to play through these international breaks. And this year, thank God, in their infinite wisdom, Albright and Noonan said, no, it's an international window. We anticipate having lots of players who could be on international duty during these time periods. We're not going to play. So I, I, I care a little less. Um, but yeah, like there have been times where we, it would have been great if we could have had Brandon Vasquez and Matt Miazga back during Gold Cup since they weren't playing on nights that we were playing. Where they could have just yeah, said, I don't think Miazga, I don't think Miazga played the first game. No. For the U.S. men's <laughs> national team. No, there were, like, if you go back and look at the schedule, I think there, was, there, there were days where they could have played for FC Cincinnati blown out and still got their 20 minutes in with the national team a day later or two days later. I mean, Christ, it, it of all the tournaments you could have done that with, the Gold Cup was the easiest because most of these games were taking place like a puddle. They could have sent Carl's fl- plane to go get these guys most of the time. But again, yeah, and then, oh, and then also Toronto, when we played them uh, during the week, the first week where we had lost players for Gold Cup. They had several Canadian national team players playing for them on that Wednesday. Right, because the Can- who where where the Canadian national team had just said, "All right, you could just join us after you play that Wednesday game." Make it make sense, for the love of Christ! Somebody make it make sense. Ah, uh, man, I forgot about that. Yeah, see, I got mad all over again about that. Just the Gold Cup will always make me mad. I don't think I think yeah. I think we're canceling the Gold Cup on this podcast too. We might need to have Kevin for a vote on that, but I, I might be ready to cancel the Gold Cup. There's too, there's too many cups. Like you don't need the Gold Cup and the Nations League Cup. I want to put it this way: if I'm okay with the U pick a number stuff, like the U twenty, U twenty three, whatever it is, but if there is ever a tournament where you are sending the B team to play it. That's a tournament that doesn't need to exist. So if we're not going to call in the top stars of the national team to play the Gold Cup, that's a tournament that doesn't need to exist as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And you could just send, like, I'm, I'm glad Brandon got to go and score score a bunch of goals. Yeah, happy you know, for him. In, in Gold Cup. I think it's great for him. No, no shade on him. Um, I'd go and I'd want to play well too. But I thought ahead of time they should have called in who they thought would be the Olympic team for next year and use it as a U23 like gelling right tournament because that because they haven't done they just announced an Olympic coach like they they haven't done shit with the U23 level uh and there's a there's an Olympics coming up next year which like I know it's not the biggest tournament but it still matters <laughs> we haven't won anything that people would like recognize as like a international trophy. So you ask, you ask, if, you ask the average American, just, you know, Joe on the street, would you rather win the gold cup of CONCACAF or an Olympic gold medal? The answer is an Olympic gold medal. So, I mean, it would be awesome for, to have an American men's team. Cause the women have, have done great. Right. But it would be awesome to have an American men's team go to the Olympics next year and win a medal. Make the Gold Cup a women's tournament. That's my hot take right They now. are doing a women's Gold Cup. Of course, they're just adding one. They're not going to... No, yep, they're just adding just one. Change yeah. it. Make it a women's tournament. Um, I, I think before we leave the international duty segment, we should mention that there was the potential that Arias and Morena would play each other because Colombia beat Venezuela last Thursday, one nothing. Yes. But again, neither, neither of them played. 
Yeah. So the battle for Cincinnati was off. Off. We'll have to wait to the Crosstown shootout to settle it once and for all. Uh, other FCC-related and adjacent news. Uh, the same players are training that were training last week, so there's no new updates on any of that. Hooray, Dom Bodge. Bodge's back. Right? Oh, you said Bod- You said Bodge's yeah, back. Bodge's yeah, I'm sorry. I was, stuck at, I was stuck at Burning Man. Right, yeah, for, you know. I didn't listen. You know, while you were trying to dodge the raindrops in the mud, that's we found out that Bodge is back. That's exciting. Um, this is our twice a year check in on FCC two. Do we are, are we giving a shit yet? What's the official stance that the podcast has on the FCC two team? I can't, I can't care no. about FCC two. I care about player development, right? right? The two team has already given us Brett Halsey, who was signed right. to a two team contract and um, has shown that you know he's a senior first team level player and can give you good minutes. So I'm happy with the two team this year. I don't know. Like what 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 do you want other than than the two team I don't know. identifying and developing players for the first team. It kind of reminds me a little bit of uh in baseball, the people that obsess over farm teams and what your farm system ranked. It's like I don't care what your farm system's ranked, like what players are being produced by it what stars are coming up like the farm system only exists to produce talent i don't give a shit how the teams individually do like how did this pitcher do or how did this player do although i do note fcc2 in second to last place behind only in front of i should say inner miami <laughs> so no matter where you go inner miami bottom of the standings absent their incredible incredible cheating stars that they've accumulated on things uh, just don't, don't, don't win the wooden spoon in any league. I feel like that's just, just the marching orders in general for FCC teams. Don't win. I'm, a, I'm a little surprised that Inter Miami two hasn't signed like their next three DPS for next year <laughs> to the two team. Just like, like kind of hold them for a little bit. Like why isn't Luis Suarez and Antoine Griezmann playing for Inter Miami two right now? You say that like, that's not a possibility still this year. Oh sure, it's it's definitely a possibility. Roman Berkey was playing in uh, MLS Next Pro last year. <laughs> <laughs> Do they call it the wooden spoon in that league? Is that what you win? I, have no uh, idea. I think it's the I think it's the wooden spork. The spork. Don't win the spork. Anything else for FC Cincinnati before we kick it over to segment two? It's been a busy week. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely nothing. There are things I want to talk about. There's nothing that we should talk about. It's the story of our lives. <laughs> All right, well then, moving over to segment two, we're going to do a little MLS roundup, uh, MLS news, teams, results that FCC fans should be looking at. So stick with us, and we'll see you back on the other side. This episode is also brought to you by Cincy Shirts. Look, you know Cincy Shirts. You love Cincy Shirts. They've been with FCC from the beginning, and we here at the Postcast, we're just huge fans of their work. They were very early sponsors of the Postcast here, and we have always enjoyed their work. If you head on over to CincyShirts.com, that's Cincy with a Y, Shirts.com, and check out using the promo code ThePostCincy, all one word, all caps, you will get 10% off your order, and you let them know that we sent you. Like they have MLS and MLSPA licensed FCC gear available online and at their two retail locations in Hyde Park and Fort Mitchell. If they don't have your size on the shelf, they can print you one on the spot. That is a fantastic feature and something that I have used as well. So again, special thank you to Cincy Shirts. Head on over to their website or check the link down below in the description for the promo code the post Cincy for 10% off your next order. And a huge thank you to Cincy Shirts. And we're back. Grayson, turning our attention now to the rest of MLS. Not a bad weekend if you're scoreboard watching as a fan of the FC. Um, The New England Revolution, who we'll be talking about a little more here in a second, they finally played their game in hand they had over us and ended up drawing at the death with Minnesota, which is one of those ties that feels definitely like a loss. So... You have to love that. Um, that was a 1-1 draw. 
Additionally, elsewhere around the league, LAFC took a loss to Portland, which is helpful in the Supporters' Shield standings. And as we tape this right now, uh, it looks like, yep, they're still winning. Uh, St. Louis still winning right now, 2-1 to one over LA Galaxy. Inter-Miami won again, drink. And, uh, yeah, you know, this was not a, not a bad weekend for the FC. Yeah, um, notably, St. Louis is playing now a man down. Why do you see that now? So they got about LA's got thirty minutes to do something here. To do the funniest thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, as we look at the standings in MLS and around MLS, uh, FC Cincinnati now finds itself nine points clear of the New England Revolution, but that game in hand has disappeared. Philadelphia still has a game in hand down in fourth place at 46 points, so they could theoretically leap up to make the, uh, the difference eight points there if they win their game in hand eventually. So in the East, if you're looking at the scoreboard, Cincinnati on 57 points, New England on 48, Orlando City on 47, Philly with that game in hand on 46. That's your top four in the East. In the West, St. Louis, who is currently winning, Sitting on 50 points where, uh, well, that's that's the live table. So that could, Yeah, that's that, where they would yeah, be if, if, they, they if win, that if they result hold, holds. Result holds, they'd be on for 47 points right now. will be 50 if this result holds. Seattle down at 41, LAFC at 40, Real Salt Lake at 40 as well, topping out your top four. Pretty much it's turned into uh, St. Louis is the only team, I think, that has even a remote chance of catching FC Cincinnati at this point. So, and we do have a game in hand on St. Louis. We do. So hopefully, by the time this podcast airs and by the time we finish this taping, we'll have better news about where the St. Louis result is. But all in all, scoreboard, uh, we're going to emerge from this little mini, mini break, the loss to Orlando City notwithstanding. We're going to emerge from this little break not in terrible position to close out the final run of games here in the Supporters' Shield chase. The bigger news dropping, the bigger news dropping uh, this week involves Bruce Arena, uh, who was placed on administrative leave by the New England Revolution um, over a month ago, a month and a half ago, uh, amid allegations that he had made an inappropriate remark. Bruce Arena officially let go by the New England Revolution. Resigned. Resigned. Te- the the public announcement is he resigned. Public announcement is a resignation, accompanied by one of the more interesting MLS PR releases I've ever seen. I don't know if you've seen anything like this. Uh, MLS statement on Bruce Arena. I'm going to read this in its entirety because this is this is a doozy. It was announced earlier this evening that Bruce Arena has resigned as sporting director and head coach of the New England Revolution. Arena was placed on administrative leave on July 30th pending a review into allegations that he made insensitive and inappropriate remarks. As a result of the investigation, which confirmed certain of these allegations, should Arena wish to pursue further employment within MLS, he must first submit a petition to the commissioner. MLS is committed to a safe and welcoming work environment and expects all employees of the league and its clubs to conduct themselves appropriately in the workplace. I have a lot of thoughts about this entire process with Bruce Arena, but I'm curious to hear what your reaction is to the news that was dumped on us on a Saturday night. Yeah, so I um Man, it was it was it was weird because the sequence of events was the Athletic publishes an article right before the Revolution game that Bruce Arena is not expected to go back to the New England Revolution as head coach. Right. Okay. The New England game happens, and then immediately after the game, two di- two statements come out. One is Bruce Arena's statement that he's resigned, and the other is the league statement, um, that 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 you just read. Right. Um. Bruce Arena's statement was, I think, uh, I haven't gone back and read it since last night, but like nothing really stood out to me no. from his statement. Um, what did stand out to me was from the Athletics article, which 
like all of these things, right? Right. A lot of the juicier bits are from sources, not from reporting. Named right. named people. Well, it's from reporting, right. but like but, source source gate. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, um, they they mention that um, the the comments at issue were made by were allegedly made behind closed doors to coaching staff. Okay. And that at least, and that the complaints were filed by assistant coach, Richie Williams. And this immediately was frankly shocking to me. Like, I don't know these people. I don't know their, their relationships with each other, but I do know that, that Richie Williams played for arena at, Virginia like 30 some years ago. Right. And he's been working for Bruce Arena for to my knowledge decades. Right. At multiple uh coaching stops. Right. So the fact that like the complaints would come from this guy was 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 interesting. Wild. Certainly. Not interesting. Wild. 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 Like, yes. You're talking about behind closed doors with your coaches all of whom, for the most part, are people that you hand-selected to be there, mostly because they're people that you trust and that you are loyal to and who are loyal to you. This is the idea of a coach, an assistant coach, diming out his boss is just an unfathomable thing, the way that like these coaching circles and how tight-knit this community is. like That wasn't just odd. That's shocking. Yeah, and... Um, Williams, of course, has been the interim uh, while Arena has been suspended. And um, another tidbit in the article, or a couple of tidbits, are that uh, Bruce Arena had a multi-year contract extension with the Revolution, um, but much of the staff did not, including Williams and including Kurt Anolfo, the sporting director. And also what the article said was that um, Anolfo, who has also worked with Arena in various capacities since the 90s, or maybe not consistently since, but like worked with Arena in the 90s and has a long relationship with him. Um, that the two of them uh, clashed over player signings and that Anolfo had largely been marginalized from personnel decisions. Um, it also said that Arena Williams, Arena Williams, and Anolfo uh, clashed during the twenty-two and twenty-three seasons over differences between the club's sporting direction and tactics. And what, why that jumps out to me is not that it would be odd that people on a staff would have different, maybe have different ideas about you know players and tactics and play style. What jumped out to me is like, what is that doing in this article? Right. Like it's the, the, the suspension was centered around, you know, inappropriate and insensitive remarks. Okay. And to be fair, we That's, don't know what was said. We don't know. What, we don't know what was we said. No, still don't know. And so we have, we have, and I've heard, I listened to a revs, uh, 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 spaces, last night from like uh, their CST or something. And you could tell they were feel they, you could tell that they were emotional over the results of the game and also the news like happening at the same time because people were making just, just really, really like they, they were, they were digging in, right. let's say, and, and making comments about individuals character and about what, Arena might or may not, uh, Arena might or may not have said we don't we don't know what he said, you know right, and we don't know what motivated whoever to make complaints about the comments right right, but what this article feels uh, designed to do is to make us think that like. Williams made the complaint because he's mad about his 
contract not being extended or because he wants to replace arena as coach. Right. You know, yeah, it like, feels like a hit. It's just, it's, it feels like a hit. It feels like a hit piece. And not just a hit, like, like that. It was a hit that his assistants did because they were being marginalized. They were clashing over player signings. So they went and betrayed him and put a knife in his back over something that was said where he thought he was in safe space among friends, among people he trusted because like, all of this extra included information only makes sense in the context of they were looking for a reason to get rid of him and his coaches no longer had loyalty to him and so betrayed him in some way to get him out. Because the guy who we're talking about here is now the interim coach, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And then obviously the sporting director, or maybe not obviously, but presumably the sporting director would have stepped into the the – you know, technical director or GM or whatever, because you know Bruce was, was everything. He was, was like yeah. was like one of the only guys in the league. Him and like I think Peter Vermees, uh, I guess Bob Bradley, but that didn't didn't work out obviously. Who was like wearing that dual hat right role? Um, and again, like it it was it was weird as hell that there was complete silence on this right for. Which is my six weeks, except for except for Kalen Kyle right. saying he may use like a racial slur, right? Which I I I admit I'm not listening to I'm not watching like the all the MLS 360 or listening to Extra Time every episode, but like I'm not sure I've seen Kalen Kyle in any MLS media since that happened. The wild thing to me with all this, and again, it's hard to it's hard to talk about this in the information vacuum of not knowing what was said and what the conduct right. was, but just from a outside looking in the amount, the lack of transparency with everything involved in this is just bananas. Like you talk about the statement references, the league statement references July 30th as when he was placed on administrative leave. And there has been nothing from the league officially as to what was going on with the Bruce arena investigation. And so you're left wondering, A, what in God's name took 40 days to investigate when it comes to statements that were made behind closed doors where presumably there were only a couple of people in the room where it happened? That's one. Like, what the hell took 40 days about this? And then to come out in the dead of night on a Saturday night right after a game is played and say, uh, by the way, he's resigning. And, oh, also, if he ever wants to coach in this league again or work in this league again, he's going to need to seek special permission of the commissioner. What the hell? <laughs> and, and this is, this is like, this is a giant of American soccer, right? Former you national know? team manager. Like one of the most successful national, the most successful national team man manager of our lifetimes. Yes. Right. The 2002 world cup was probably the singular highlight of my U S men's national team fandom. Yeah. You know, and, and he's won, I don't know how many MLS Cups off the top of my head, like five. He's won Supporter Shields. He's won U.S. Open Cup. Um, he's a titan of American he's soccer. probably, I assume, you know, the first or second most winningest MLS manager. Um, I don't know if that's true. I just assume that that's true. Right. Um, and then you're just going to kind of like, Briefly say he's suspended, and then six weeks later say essentially he's fired, right? Not because just, not just fired, because he's banned from the league, <laughs> right? Yeah, because even if it is him resigning, like okay, he resigns, but he also needs to ask permission to come back. Like that feels like a firing, right? Can you imagine? And you're not gonna, you're not gonna like, you're not gonna say. Anything else about it? No. It's like the equivalent of this would be like if Nick Saban was all of a sudden put on administrative leave by Alabama and was no, no news for a month, which let me tell you something. The fan base the fan base around college football, the SEC, and Alabama in general wouldn't tolerate no news for a month. There would be people chaining themselves to doors to find information out with shit. 
And then all of a sudden, Nick Saban is told, not only are you not allowed to coach at Alabama or in college ever again, you're going to have to ask permission from the NCAA or the SEC to coach football again. Like, And then not to say anything more about it, just, uh, we concluded our investigation, he's banned from the league forever. What? Just no, there's no other league where this lack of transparency would be tolerated at all, flat out. Just there would be demands to know every detail. There would be demands to publish reports. And instead, we get a Twitter statement from MLS PR. I don't, I don't get it. I don't get, how, I don't get how this league can expect to be taken seriously on one level and demand the uh, treatment, equal treatment, as a result of them signing Golden Boy down in Miami and still pull off minor league bullshit like this. I just don't understand it. Not even defending anything he may or may not have said. The process on this seems crooked and weird as fuck. Yeah, and I, I think, and again, we don't know. We don't, nobody seems to know what any of it was about. Certainly nobody is willing to say what any of it was about. But the way that this has come out, the way this has played out in the public eye is, you know, one, not how, as Chief said, any other professional sports league would operate. And two, it just it just feels like it's not meeting the stature no. of a figure like Bruce Arena. We know more about why Ron Jans was fired than we do why Bruce Arena has been forced to resign or has resigned and has been banned from the league. That's wild to me. We still don't know what song Ron sang, so if you know that, hit me in the DMs. That's like my one, that's my holy grail piece of information for around FC Cincinnati. We, we, want to, we want to break that so bad. The worst way. I, I, I know there's video footage of it, too. I've, well, I've been told there's I'll be honest footage. with you. I don't need to break it. I need to know it. I do it. need to know it. I need it. to know it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'll promise not to break it. I just need to know it. That's the more important part of all this. Um, now, there, there's one other thing on this that I'm not really sure what to make heads or tails of, but I find it funny. Let's go with it. I find it interesting. Um, there's this guy, uh, Chris Mega, Mega Loudus. Okay. Mega Loudus. I think Mega Loudus, Mega Lotus, Mega Loudus, Mega Loudus. I think is like a dinosaur, Mega Loudosaurus. No. Yeah, um, he's a he's an MLS agent. He represents a num. He represents a bunch of American players. Um, uh, he represents you know Paul Ariola, Brian Reynolds, Sebastian Legette, DeAndre, DeAndre Yedlin, uh, Chris Durkin is how he got on my radar because we were linked to Chris Durkin last year. So, right. um. Was kind of monitoring like everything around him. He represents he represents Dave Romney on the Revolution. Um, and when the story came out, or a little after the story came out, he tweeted, "No, with Mexican flags on either side, no I and no bueno," and added Tom Bogert. <laughs> that that means there is no good dwarf. And then again, <laughs> 12 hours ago at 9.29 a.m., the day after, he said, you know, dicho, no hay enano bueno, which means, you know, it's said there is no good dwarf. Hmm. And I don't, I'm not personally, like, <clears throat> obviously, like, I have nothing against Tom Bogert. Right. But... I do appreciate a hater (laughs) and for this guy who's like an MLS agent and seemingly like a pretty big MLS agent to tweet a fairly, I think vicious personal attack on a, on an MLS journalist and to leave no doubt by tagging him in the tweet and then doubling down on it immediately afterward and doubling, not immediately afterward, like 12 hours, the next morning, 12 hours. That means he slept on it and he was like, no, I really want, and I, I do want to point out this, these tweets, both of them, no replies, no retweets, no likes. Hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know exactly what's going on here, but it feels like some public messiness that we're not getting the full flavor of. Yeah, it's about par for the course with MLS, isn't it? Yeah. What does he think about Tom Bogerl, though? That's the real question. I was going to say, like, we should... 
so whoever runs the Tom Bogirl account. <laughs> yeah, whoever that whoever that masked man is. Should should start like <laughs> fighting with him, but I don't I don't want to get into it with an agent and like like I don't know, um, I don't really know this agent. I was just like kind of following him for a bit when the Chris Dirk and stuff was going on. So like one, I'm not trying to pick a fight with anybody here, right. the agent or Tom Bogert. I just am expressing my appreciation for this guy's willingness to just. Go put that out there two footed and double down the next day Mo- like most children of the 90s the one thing i think of when i hear the word agent is when you see an agent you run <laughs> <laughs> and then they ruined that like they did everything in that movie with the sequels sadly um that's a film room that we could have a wild time with in the off season is how bad the two matrix sequels were um i uh, i like the Matrix sequels. Oh, then we're definitely adding this to the list. All right, it, I watched them. I watched them last year on a plane. I watched the new one and on a plane. The, the new one. I I liked the new one. I like the new one a lot too. Like I enjoy the meta commentary and like how it leaned entirely into the idea of cash in sequels as part of its its writing, which is, you know what? That's more credit than I gave it. So I would have given it originally when they wrote it. And, and I like that it was. I like that it was deliberately trolling a particular kind of Matrix fan. Yes. Yeah, no, I love any movie that has the... the, the I don't love it in all circumstances, but like when it's... Right, du- you have to pull it off. Yeah, like, you know, they tried it in Star Wars and it failed miserably. Like, hating your own fan base works sometimes. It, it doesn't work all the time, so it's a deft hand required. And to be clear, I didn't think the same people responsible for Jupiter Ascending had that kind of skill to pull that off, so... Cloud Atlas is quite good. We might have to do a Wachowski's podcast because, like, they they run. Like, it's gonna be it's gonna be like a separate podcast. I don't know. We're gonna have to run. We could we could periodically go through the Wachowski filmography and do as like kind of like a side cast, right? I don't know. Like, it would have to include all of us doing drugs to watch Speed Racer, though. I don't know how down Kevin is for that as a parent. Hmm. We'll figure it out. We're live programming right now. Uh, anything else around MLS? What's our update on St. Louis? Uh, what are we doing right here? Uh, They're still winning. Fuck. Oh, uh, Galaxy, I think, just scored. Oh. Oh, do tell. There's a, they're, they're doing a replay of a goal. Tim Parker's hand is up, but like I don't know what he's complaining about. Well, you know what that means. That means we can't stop recording yet. So come on over to segment three. Because, spoiler alert, I just say we're changing segments, and we really just keep taping immediately afterwards. Come over to segment three for a little in the 11, out of the 18, while we talk until this game ends. Stick around. And we're back. Final segment of the show. Grayson, you didn't get to participate in the midweek episode for the return of in the 11, out of the 18. So we're bringing it back one more time in this little mini off season. We're having in the eleven, out of the eighteen. Grayson, what are you putting in the eleven this week? Uh, so I in the eleven is um, I feel like I, I I may risk making some people mad by both 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 of my in the eleven and out of the eighteen this week. But I, I love it. Um, they're both they're both content based. Um. My in the eleven is I watched uh, the HBO documentary Telemarketers over the weekend, oh. and it was really not on my radar at all. I think it's been out for a month or so, but it was it was fascinating, and it went to places that I was not anticipating. Like, for um, example, it, so I don't want to spoil it. Okay. All right. So, but, but first it's, so it's about these guys who work as telemarketers at this company that, um, so that solicits people to donate to like the fraternal order of police or like other like police veterans related organizations. And are these telemarketers or scammers? That's a big difference right off the top. They're, they're scammers. Okay. Okay. Perfect. They, they are get, they are taking, they are representing themselves as like 
employees, but the company like represents itself as like affiliated with formerly like these organizations. Right. But the company is is keeping ninety percent of the money and giving like ten percent to the to the organizations. Still better than most scammers. And um they uh the, the, so the first episode starts off with like they say like okay well this is like a job where there's no commissions and they hire people who like really have like nothing else can't get a job like elsewhere so people with like high school dropouts um people with criminal records people with drug problems right and they don't really care if people are like doing drugs or drinking like in the office and this one guy, he had just dropped out of high school. The the director right. had just dropped out of high school and got a job with this company. This is like the mid aughts or mid late aughts. And he starts putting like office shenanigans and stuff like up on YouTube. <laughs> and you and I think like, oh, this is like a fun thing where it's just like showing you people who are like kind of on the margins, just like going through their day and stuff. And it's very much not that. Um, and it ends up raising like a bunch of questions about like, not questions, but like it touches on a whole bunch of issues about like, you know, how like one of the things going on in America right now is like people don't get rich by, you know, making products and selling them to people that those people then use and enjoy. They get rich by the service economy. Yeah. They get, or they get rich by figuring out a way to like just convince someone to give me their money. Right. Right. And like you have like that whole VC industry Let's where say, it's like when you do it when you do it over the phone it's called scamming when you ask people for money for your startup it's called venture capital right well it, but there is like a, a flavor of, of that in venture capital either where you have all these guys that have made a ton of money as like quote unquote entrepreneurs and um, but like you look at their companies and like none of their companies ever did anything no. all they did was like raise a bunch of money get the company sold. And eventually, like, somebody else gets caught holding the bag, but they got their money and walked away. Right. You know? And, like, that's – I'm not going to name anybody by any any names here, but I, there's been, like, multiple examples of, like, people who I've seen, like, run for office both locally and nationally who are like, oh, I am an entrepreneur. I made money in business. And you, like, look at what they did. And it's like, no, you just, like, convinced people to give you money. This part of the post, but you never. This part of the post produced anything. Sponsored by the letter V, but continue. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. V for venture capital. There we go. Among yeah, other we, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Among other it'll, things. It'll do it. Um, but and it's also about like, you know, what kind of people we view as like, you know, outcasts and undesirable versus what other people get to be like respectable in society and like who is like the bigger blight on society between like these two different people. Um, like there's a character who I f- was thoroughly charmed by um, who at the beginning of the, at the beginning of the show, he is a full on like heroin addict who like does heroin and then gets on the phone and just like kind of, kind of jabbers. But like, this is a guy who like largely was like not not hurting anybody and you see like he's got like a very good kind of moral compass even if he's got poor decision making. And then you got like the people that own the company who are just straight up scammers that get to like kind of be part of society and you get even like the people who in government who act like they care about this problem who do they really care about and prefer? Like those people still probably favor the rich dudes running the scamming company versus like the little people who, you know, kind of forced into it through all kinds of circumstances, you know, partly within their control, but partly out of their control, you know, and you can have like that kind of complicated view of, of how people end up and still like, you know, appreciate them as people. The, uh, the scamming industry is, absolutely wild it's grossly underreported in terms of just what a blight it is on society i'm passingly familiar with this due to you know the chief's nine to five job here um 
the number of people that get taken by these telemarketers where they call and say you're donating to X charity, the number of people that just willingly give credit card numbers over the phone to donate to these things is terrifying. The amount of money that is lost on a yearly basis on this is in the tens of billions of dollars. And it's exactly the people that you think are getting taken by this. So if you're listening and you haven't talked to your grandparents in a while, give them a call and tell them to disconnect their landline phone, flip the switch on their iPhone that says, do not uh, show callers from an unknown number. And for the love of God, tell them never to respond to any emails that they don't know the sender of. Their computer is not infected with a virus. They have not won the lottery. Their grandchild has not been arrested and is awaiting bail and needs to have Bitcoin deposited into an account to get out of jail. Uh, it's a wild world out there, and it's only getting worse for everyone over the age of, we'll say, 75, um, according to FBI statistics. <laughs> yeah, and it's not it's not an accident that that those folks tend to be the main victim of these of these scams. No. And that's what they are targeted. They're a thousand percent targeted and they are targeted. It turns out because it's very easy to figure out how old everyone is because our voter records are online and you can just pay companies who will give you a scrape of all the data of people say over the age of 75 and you can target them with all sorts of nefarious bullshit. And uh, yeah, there was a story a couple months ago where a, uh, a guy in a gas station, I want to say it was down in Houston was, See, it was an old dude. You got to be like 82, 83, somewhere in that range. Was wandering into a gas station in the middle of not the best neighborhood in Houston and started depositing cash by the hundreds of dollars into a Bitcoin ATM. And it was only because the clerk was, this seems a little odd, and found out the guy was on the phone with some scammer in some God knows where country that was instructing him that you need to put this money in this ATM machine and we'll give you the code that unlocks your computer from the virus that it has. So it's a scary and, it's a scary fucking world out there, folks. And this is not the most important thing in the series, but it's something I appreciated, I think especially since I started doing this podcast. There is like a minor subplot about how hard it is to interview people. <laughs> and to like be good at being at giving an interview. Do they have any tips cuz we could definitely use them? Well, it's, I think there's no, like, it's not as express, I think, as one, but it's kind of a running thing. And I think the only tip you can glean from it is, uh, well, one, um, you know, active listening, for yeah, sure. Nod. Um, but two, like, you get better the more you do it. I think we're proof that's not true. That's all right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, in my 11 this week, I'm going to put the Eastgate Mall. You ever been to the Eastgate Mall, Grayson? Maybe. Maybe, yeah. So uh, I grew up back in the bad old days out in the Anderson, Milford, Loveland, that area. Oh, yeah, I've been to the Eastgate Mall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just a, Sorry. I... Just a sad place. Um, but when I was growing up after the Beachmont Wall closed, that was my mall back when people still went to malls. For anyone under the age of, I'll say, 25 listening, a mall is a place where all of these stores that you buy things from online used to have physical presences, and you would actually have to go there to buy things. It was filled with stores that no longer exist, such as Sam Goody, Suncoast, which sold VHS tapes. Look in your parents' basement to see what a VHS tape is if you've never seen one. Um... You used to be able to buy sporting goods at the mall, Brendamore's. There was a food court that had all sorts of wonderful concoctions in places that you never saw anywhere else outside of a mall food court. The great steak. You could usually the, get some free samples of Chinese ginger chicken. Uh, the bourbon chicken. Yeah. Yes, from like bourbon chicken. Bourbon chicken. Yeah. yeah, from the place that uh, it was yeah. the New Orleans or the Bourbon Street Grill, but yet somehow it sold Chinese food. So, you know, hey, it was delicious and it was free. The Great Steak and Potato Company. I don't think I've ever seen that outside of a mall. Uh, you, is Great Steak and Potato Company what the Thunderdome Restaurant Group guys came from? Is it? That'd be incredible if it was true. Can you look that? I'm gonna, fact, I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look this up. Yeah, you fact, keep going. Fact check me because this would be the most incredible. Like this would make doing the podcast worthwhile for this week if I learned that fact because that would be absolutely wild. But anyway, the Eastgate Mall has in fact been sold. Uh, a new developer sold yep. to a Georgia. Their 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 dad. Are you serious? 
Um, yep. So wait, the Great Steak... Their and- father, Nick Lonnie, founded the Great Steak and Potato Company in um, the Dayton Arcade. No shit. Which is recently revitalized. And that's why we have the Eagle. Yeah. Hell yeah. All right. See, mall food courts have been empowering Americans for generations. And this, this is, is like basically the Ark of the Godfather. Or at least, not the Ark of the Godfather, but it's the Ark that like Don Vito envisioned for Michael. <laughs> <laughs> a, a mall food court uh, mogul that transforms his business to real brick and mortar and gets out of the mall game at the exact right and like, time. Pretty, pretty high, you know, mid upscale dining with yeah. like Pep and Dolores. Yeah. Pep and Dolores, uh, Eagle. Um, who else, what else does Thunderdome do? Did they do, um, I think they have a new thing coming up in the old Royce space, but I don't think I've seen what it is yet. Phenomenal. Were they, uh, were they revolution too? Or was that a different one? That was a different one, but they are Corito. Corito, yes, Corito also. Ba- so Corito, Bakersfield, Bakersfield, that Eagle, was the other one. Kruger's, Kruger's, Pep and Dolores, great burger. Their ghost pepper burger was delicious. Um, I, I've heard I've heard mixed things about how that company is to work for, but I'm not going to say anything about it because you know Food. if you're not a sponsor of us yet, you're, you're potential, a potential, potential sponsor. sponsor. No, and I yeah. I love Pep and Dolores. Uh, tremendously. Yeah, no. I love the food at all those places. But anyway, they used to have a... Re- they, there was a great steak and potato company at the Eastgate Mall, if I'm not mistaken. And I used to eat there because I loved going to the mall as a kid. Buy a new video game. Go to KB Toys. Toy stores. That used to be a thing, too. Uh, it's been sold to a Georgia-based real estate developer for an undisclosed price. They're going to attempt to reposition the mall. Um, yeah. The Eastgate Mall. Just so many happy memories. There was the Adventureland miniature golf across the way. There was a movie theater in the parking lot, but um, Toys R Us in the parking lot too. That's where I bought Super Mario Three. I was the coolest kid on my block when that happened. So for exactly two weeks, I was cool. Eastgate Mall, tough times though. You know they still have a Sears that's closed there, which isn't a great thing. Uh, y- you knew shit was going downhill when they had an anchor store that was a place called Stephen Barry which their gimmick was they sold Ooh. college apparel for nothing over five ninety nine, except for when they got an exclusive deal to sell Stefan Marbury's shoes, the Starberries, for twenty four ninety nine. You could buy a pair of athletic shoes. Not great when that's one of your feature stores. So as a child of the Anderson Township area, I am, I'm rooting for the Eastgate Mall. I'm rooting for the comeback. I don't know that it's going to happen because I don't know that malls are ever going to be a thing ever again. But you know what? If the Eastgate Mall can come back, that would that would make my day. So in the eleven, Eastgate Mall getting one more shot with a new developer, and I hope I hope they're trying to bring them all back. And this isn't all an excuse to build some more stupid gray slate condo looking things on the property. Yeah, I, I'm all for bringing bringing malls back. I it seems like a like a nostalgia piece that hasn't hit yet, right? Um, but I do have pleasant thoughts about. Um, spending a lot of time at like Hot Topic and what was it Spencer's, Spencer's. gifts? Yeah, because I gravitated to a particular kind of young lady in high school. <laughs> you do tell. I can't. I can't <laughs> picture who this person looks like based on those two stories alone. <laughs> um, although I will say though that like malls may be ready for a come up because we're already halfway there with the concept of the food hall, where the food hall really is just a mall food court without the mall attached so just give me the mall too give me something to go go shop at after i enjoy my delicious food grayson what's out of your 18 this week all right i gotta be real you gotta be real careful i think with how i explain my my beef here but this is always so good. um so um i'm gonna do a little bit of a preface okay so w- william F- Mil- william freakin died a couple weeks ago, film director. Um, and so I've, I've been watching a few of his movies. And one of his movies is The Exorcist. Okay. Which I think, great movie. Maybe even perfect start to finish. Um, really, very watchable. A lot more going on with, with the characters. A real nice slow burn um, than, than, than I think many people remember. 
Um, I think people forget how much of a like character drama it is versus like a straight up horror, uh, scary movie. Right. Um, but one of the, one of the aspects of the exorcist that I think makes it so compelling is it's like very much like a meditation on like faith and specifically Catholic faith and terrifying. I'm not, was that terrifying too? Yeah, absolutely. But I'm not a, um, you know, like I'm not a particularly religious person. Right. Right. But I like a movie that, that, that decides, yeah, we're going to take this idea seriously and we're going to wrestle with it. And in the exorcist, they take the idea that there is a, that the, the war between the Catholic church and the demons is a real thing that people have like largely forgotten about and neglected, but it is real and ongoing. And the way that you fight the demons is with like Catholic liturgy, right? The mass, right? Yeah. So like, and I'm not saying that like this means like the Catholic faith is the only like proper faith. Right. But right. It's the lore of the movie. Like the movie is based on this assumption that it is, you know, like that's the lore. So recently I saw a trailer for the exorcist. I guess a new like sequel takes place in the same universe. Right. Cause Ellen bursting comes back. It's called like the exorcist believer. And it's by people I generally like Danny McBride and David Gordon green. Um, but there's a scene in the trailer where the, the Ellen Burstyn, who plays the mom in the original Exorcist, says, you know, every culture has developed ways to, like, fight uh, demons, and we're going to need all of them. And it's like, that's now not, this is... Not, this, that's stupid. That's okay, not the... Exor- just, right. if you want to do the super best friends, just make that separate movie. This was like a plot of a you know? South Park episode, where all of, like, Jesus, yeah. Mohammed... Moses, they all got together to fight terrorism or something. I forget what it was, but yeah, like this isn't the Exorcist. The Exorcist, it's about the Catholic. It's the Catholic Catechism. It's a it's a meditation yep. on Catholic faith. It's you're making a different so, fucking movie now, and that might also be a good movie. But it's not the Exorcist. It's not the Exorcist. That's my only point. So that's why I'm putting it out of the eighteen. Right. That might it still might be a very enjoyable movie. But it's not and you could probably make. You could probably make a really good movie that's like, you know, everybody, all the cultures have have centered on like some universal truths. Right. Right. Which is probably honestly closer to like something I would subscribe to in the real world. But you could make like some universalist kind of movie where it's like, you know, we're, we're taking the what everybody got right and using it to fight the forces of evil. It's just, uh, it's, it's cool. Just neat. you just don't have to you don't have to put The Exorcist on that movie, right? If you're gonna remake The Exorcist, remake the fucking Exorcist. Like, have something interesting to say. Like, it's not like the Catholic Church hasn't given you a lot of great new material to mine in your commentary about what the church is and how the church would fight the forces of evil, given some of the struggles it's been through to find itself over the last, I don't know, I guess thousands of years, but. That's frustrating. Yeah, and That's you know, there's there's plenty of other religions that probably also deserve to have their own. Right. Teach me, uh, teach me uh, something new about a new religion. Then, in that case, that would be that would be yeah. interesting. That's something that I wouldn't know what's coming uh, when it comes to that. I agree. That's yeah. Well, that's a movie I'm not going to see. Maybe I will. I don't know. I'm probably going to see I'll it because I'm kind it. of a sucker for possession movies. Yeah, I'll probably see it. I, the original Exorcist is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um. Out of the 18 for me this week, so we'll, we'll keep it Hollywood. Out of the 18 for me is uh, reality shows. So. Th- Ooh, brave. I know. I know. <laughs> brave. I, 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 somebody has to take a stand. It may as well be me. No, I. Um, this is the time of year. So it's the opening weekend of college, opening weekends of college football. This is like the first real weekend of college football when teams are playing teams who've actually heard of before. Um. First weekend of the NFL going on currently as we speak. This is the time of year where I'm actually watching over-the-air television um, 
a lot of ESPN. And this is the time of year where I am watching TV networks that are trying to sell me on watching shows that I otherwise would never watch. Like, to this day, I still don't know anyone that watches the show Ghosts. I don't know why the show Ghosts exists on CBS. I watch... I watched the I've watched the British. That doesn't ghosts. that doesn't count. That just makes you cultured. That's a that that's a funny show. I've not seen the American yeah. one. Okay. But this is the time of year where the first check in with the NFL and the first check in with college, where I'm watching ABC, CBS, NBC, and I do enjoy this little look at oh, what are people that don't subscribe to streaming services? What are they doing with their time right now? And maybe occasionally you find something that's decent or you see something that's like, oh, that's interesting. It usually just ends up being a new spinoff on 911, where now it's like, you know, 911 Topeka as they're evacuating people from Tornado Alley or whatever it is. But because of the Hollywood writer's strike and the actor's strike right now, there's no new TV out there. It's all every ad, every commercial break is for new reality shows that look somehow worse than the one before. I, I knew like I know it's it's brave to talk about how bad reality TV is, but now they're showing me pictures of people sliding in boxes down slides. And like they have a show now, a reality show called Hot Wheels Challenge, where you build life-size versions of Hot Wheels. Life-size versions of Hot Wheels are fucking cars, okay? A car is a life-size version of a Hot Wheel. A Ferrari is a life-size version of a Hot Wheel. You don't need to build a life-size Hot Wheel. You just have the car the fucking Hot Wheel is based on. This isn't a reality show. It's a car buying show. That's not interesting. Fuck. They're running out of ideas for reality television. Fucking settle the strike. I'm so mad. I hate all these people. I saw a story that Warner Brothers is projected to lose a half a billion dollars as a result of the ongoing strike. And to settle the strike and meet all the demands of the actors and the writers would only cost them $70 million a year. Like, they are losing more money than it would cost to just pay their people what they want. This is absurd. As a counterpoint, as a counterpoint the longer they don't have writers, the less likely that they're not going to be spending money on The Flash. I'll take The Flash at this point over <laughs> Hot Wheels Challenge. No, oh. but... Yeah, I'm 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 with you. I've never been a fan of reality TV, um, and I resent that like people from reality TV get keep getting like thrust into places that like like there'll be commercials for it, or they'll show up at sporting events, or they'll be in the news or something. Like my uh, my my wife is not a big like not 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 as not as big into like TV and and, and movies as I am and doesn't know as many actors. So I remember like one time, like years ago when we first started dating, um, I saw an actor, I saw Sam Rockwell yeah. in New York city. And I was like, Oh, that's Sam Rockwell. And she's like, who? And I was like, to describe stuff. And she just said, that person's not famous to me. <laughs> and I think about that like all the time. Cause it seems like, it seems like it, it, the list of people who are like not famous to me, that I still like have to look at sometimes. Right. It just gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. And it's largely because of reality TV. Reality TV and the fact that I don't I like the idea of just sitting and watching YouTube videos to me. Like streamers, that sort of stuff. That's just like a dead spot. Like not famous to me. And that person who's not famous to me. Like it was the dude who caused the riot in New York giving like PS fives away. That dude is beyond not famous to me, and he somehow got yeah. five thousand people to show up in the middle of lower of Midtown Manhattan. There was some the on the list of on the list of like quote unquote celebrities who were at the LAFC Inter Miami game. Right, you mean the one where Rage Against the Machine was just <clears> listed <throat> as one person? Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, that, that one. I was like. All of them Pretty sure. were there. So, Tom, because there's a big difference between Tom Morello and Zach De La Roca showing up in terms of what yeah. the conversation is going to be about. Um, but I think the very first person on the list was some YouTuber who may have also been YouTuber or TikToker who may have also been at Hell is Real in Columbus. And I'm like, why? 
why do they keep telling me about this person? Like, why am I hearing about this person twice in a week? It's just not. This is not. It's not okay. No. It's not. I, don't, I did not give my consent to this for sure. I did not. Uh, I did not give you permission to make this person a part of my life. I don't want to. I. I prefer not to. In fact. Oh well. You know what? Neither one of us is in danger of being famous to anyone else either. So. That's all right. It's all right with me. Two to two. Two to two. Two to it's two. Gone, LAFC St. Louis. It has gone final, final score. So. How about that? As we end this podcast, we can safely say that the FC stands nine points clear of both the Eastern, Western Conference leader and number two in the East. Grayson, do you have anything else to add to the dozen listeners that are tuning in for this midweek episode? Thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh, we really do. We really do appreciate it. We really do appreciate that you have nothing better to do with your time than listen to us talk about FC Cincinnati. Well, when there I like is to no think FC that Cincinnati. I like to think that our listeners are um, engaged in like activities, and they just allow us to share their <coughs> share their lives with them. We share your commute in in the morning, right? Like they're driving to all of the activities they're going to do. They're listening to us while they're while they're working. Um, Sharing the podcast with their loved ones. Yeah. Sharing it on Twitter and on your social media platforms too. That'd be helpful. Uh, are we gonna are we gonna give away a gift card? We gotta talk to Kevin about that. Yes, there will okay. there will be there will be a giveaway coming up, I believe, too, for sharing this podcast. So I think I think we're gonna start that hopefully after the FC comes back with our recap episode on next Monday. So stay tuned to this space for that. I do love that I learned from my sister that she will listen to the podcast occasionally, but not when my nephew is in the car because he's not allowed to hear his uncle say no no words. I uh my my wife uh subscribes to the podcast and doesn't listen to it. Don't say that. We don't need the advertisers knowing that we have people pity downloading <laughs> us. Uh, uh I'm maybe she plays us on, on mute. I don't know. She knows about but she knows about the advertisers. But does she, I tell her about the advertisers. Does she know about Dr. Cop, attorney at law? No. No. Would, no. would Sam Rockwell have a role in Dr. Cop, attorney at law? I feel like Sam Rockwell would be an incredible, incredible uh, DA. Oh, I forget. Bill, Bill Faust. Bill Faust? Yeah. I feel like Sam Rockwell would be a great Bill Faust. I like this. See, we're cat... If, and he's like right at the he's like right at the the fame level the exact the fame, fame level, level yeah. for to to now transition to like TV villain so we but it's like it'd be a juicy like yeah it'd be a good role it's a juicy role yeah, this right is, it's a this is, it's, we'll let him he 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 can cook yeah okay so we've got Rashida Jones as the heroine or the hero and Sam Rockwell as the villain we are rapidly moving towards a great pitch for this show when the writers and the actors come back from strike yep settle their demands meet their terms and on that note fuck columbus Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Cincy Postcast, which is a production of The Post Cincy. You can check us out at thepostcincy.com for all of our written content as well as links to our social media. You can follow us on Twitter and as well you can join us on our Discord server. You can find links to that server both in this episode description as well as on our website. That is where most of our conversations are going on. We have a lovely community there talking about FC Cincinnati, MLS, anything and everything else and everything in between. We also want to give a huge thanks to Jim Trace and the Makers for providing all of the music you've heard throughout this episode. They're an amazing local Cincinnati band. Again, more information about them is in the description of this episode. And if you enjoyed what you listened to and you've made it to the end, so I'm going to assume you liked it or you just can't reach your stop button, please 
like us, review us, subscribe to us, wherever you are getting your podcast. That is going to be really, really helpful. But more importantly, share this with a friend. A personal recommendation helps sped a podcast so much further. So please share this if you know somebody in your life who's an FC Cincinnati fan, an MLS fan, somebody that you think would enjoy this, pass it on over. Thank you so, so much again for listening. It blows me away that people continue to listen to us. And thank you so, so much again.